Sam opens his book with this image of a suicide bomber and, and then writes um, that, uh, you know, everybody rejoices and the parents are proud and it has this cut line at the bottom, the young parents learn his fate, and these are facts. Um, I spent months and months in the Gaza Strip. I went to many of these funerals. Uh, in fact, the reality is, uh, the first thing that happens is Hamas not only takes over the house of the bereaved before the body appears, but the entire street. They put plastic chairs out on the dirt street, they run white canopies over the top, and they trot the family out for the Western press, and if the, if the family doesn't say the approved jargon and can't that Hamas wants them to, at the very least they're beaten up, if not worse. Uh, you know, Hamas is a totalitarian organization. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it shares many characteristics with the radical Christian right of this country, and to defy it is to court violence and death. Uh, and, then, and, and I think that this kind of assumption, first of all, that, that uh, you know, Palestinian mothers don't grieve for their children is, uh, is really borders on, on racism. Uh, they, they grieve like any mother. And, uh, and, and the notion that, you know, as you write, that they somehow rejoice in the martyrdom of their children is just frankly not true. Having lived in Gaza and been in the houses, you know, I've seen mothers who don't speak for days. Uh, you, you know, the, 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 the devastation that is visited on parents by the loss of a child is, is universal, first of all. Second of all, uh, most of the suicide bombers in Gaza do not come from the middle class. They come from the refugee camps. The suicide bombers of 9-11, who I investigated uh, for the New York Times, I covered Al-Qaeda based in Paris, uh, in Europe and North Africa after 9-11. Uh, they came from the middle class, but it's a very peculiar middle class because it is a class that is displaced from origin and, has, and, and dropped, you see it with French Muslims, the five million Muslims in France. And it is that horrible identity crisis uh, that grips them. And, and in some ways, they don't belong to any culture. They don't belong in France or Germany, and they don't belong in Tunisia or Algeria or Saudi Arabia, where they come from. And it is that identity crisis that propels them into the arms of, of radical preachers who promote this utopian vision. It is that search for identity. Finally, uh, in the, the notion that somehow people in, in a place like Gaza are propelled to carry out suicide attacks because of religion, uh, I think just, you know, you wouldn't have to spend more than a few days in Gaza uh, to see that uh, these, you know, Gaza is, is now virtually one, it, it's, it's a prison. It, it's, it's a walled-in prison. People can't travel out. Uh, there's severe malnutrition. I think the last figure is over 30 percent. People are living there on, on less than a dollar a day. Uh, there isn't running water. People are sleeping 10 to a room. There's no no employment, no uh, educational system that functions. Of course, now we have a war between Fatah and Hamas on the streets of Gaza City. Uh, and, and these kids have no future. They have no prospects. And the only way they can affirm themselves in this society is through death. They at least know that if they're a Shahid, posters will be put up at their face on the wall. Uh, there'll be a huge funeral with several hundred people who fire guns behind them. And, and, and what, what, what has happened, and that's the tragedy of Oslo, the architects of Oslo, the peace agreement, understood that the, the engine to, 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 to build a lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians is economic. It is about giving Palestinians a stake in Israeli economy. It's about that possibility of, of, of Ahmed being able to buy a refrigerator and send his child to school. It's what broke the conflict in Northern Ireland. And the Israeli policies, both in the West Bank and Gaza, are becoming more draconian by the day. And, of course, they're fueling the very kind of radicalism they're trying to break. Racism. It should be pretty easy to see that my criticism of Islam is not racist. Uh, first of all, it applies with equal felicity to white Muslims uh, as to any other ethnicity. Um, uh, it... It, in some sense, it even applies more to somebody like John Walker Lind, you know, a middle-class guy from, from Marin County who discovers the Quran and decides to go off and fight with the Taliban. Uh, it, it applies more, perhaps, to somebody like uh, uh, Adam Gadan, who comes from Orange County and goes off to be the, the PR guy for uh, Al-Qaeda, because these guys don't have the alibi of having been brainwashed since infancy by their indigenous Muslim parents. Uh, they, they've adopted this. So, 
there's nothing racist about my criticism of Islam. I am criticizing the logical consequences of certain ideas, and I'm certainly not limiting my criticism of religion to Islam. I just happen to, to uh, one of the taboos I'm breaking quite consciously in my, in my speaking and writing is I'm noticing there's, that our religions are actually different. I mean, that they don't all teach the same thing. And where they do teach the same thing, they don't teach it equally well. I mean, we are not going to have a problem with Jane suicide bombers, no matter how mistreated Jane's become in this world. The, the core principle of Jainism really is nonviolence. I mean, no matter how crazy you get as a Jain in terms of your religion, you're going to become less and less violent. I mean, that you, it, there's no way you can, you can justify any sort of violence by recourse to the, to the, the principles of Jainism. Uh, to argue that the core principle of Islam is nonviolence uh, is, is truly impossible. I mean, the, if anything, the core principle of, of Islam is jihad. Uh, it is, it is uh, convert, subjugate, or kill the infidel. I mean, the, the, the Quran and the Hadith do nothing so eloquently as demonize the infidel and talk about the imperative of, of uh, s spreading the faith. Uh, if you look at the example, the historical example of Muhammad, he's rather a different character than Jesus. He is not a hippie who got crucified. He, is, he was a conquering general, uh, and Muslims draw a lot from that example. Uh, and, and let me just put, add one more thing. There, another piece that I find rather galling about, about uh, uh, this mode of apologizing for Islam, and, and certainly that raising the bogeyman of racism. Uh, one of my primary concerns, whenever I criticize Islam, the f one of the first things I say is that nobody is suffering under Islam more than Muslims. I mean, no, and, and certainly nobody's suffering more than Muslim women. Uh, and so to, to obfuscate... To, to, call it, to call it racist to criticize this, this faith, which, which has, has I mean, the, 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 the record of, of religion in general in terms of uh, the treatment of women is, is horrifying. I mean, you, the, the great geniuses of, of the Abrahamic tradition thought about the riddle of womanhood, and they gave us this, this cult of virginity, the forced marriages, bride burning, honor killing. I mean, it, 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 it is the, the, the fact that somebody like Ayan Hirsi Ali, a Somali woman who, who uh, became a Dutch parliamentarian and now is arguably one of the most hunted people on this planet because of her criticism of Islam, the idea that she has to deal with, with a multiculturalist criticism of her insensitivity to Islam, I and mean, this is a woman who has been, you know, uh, circumcised is a euphemism for it, uh, hunted, had her collaborator butchered in the street uh, in, in Amsterdam, and now uh, she is, is, is a recipient of the same kind of criticism. Uh, it, it is obscurantism. Our religions are different. <laughs>